Bill, um, in the Super Bowls in the past, you guys haven't scored in the first quarter. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to remind you. Yeah. Um, but how? Any all any no negative stuff in the Super Bowls we need to be aware of too. How 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 much do you, do you look at that history and this week and say, yeah. you know, do look, something? We try different. to score in every game. I know that's probably hard to understand, but like, we try to go out and score and keep the other team from scoring. That's our goal every game. Do you, I mean, do you, would you put in any extra time or, or change anything just to, to highlight that to the team and the importance of that this week? I mean, what's important is what happens this week against the Eagles. So <clears throat> we're going to try to score. We're going to try to keep them from scoring. Welcome into Between the Tackles. Michaela Vernava, Doug Hyde, Zach Cox at the hall at Patriot Place. And there, Bill Belichick being reminded of his Super Bowl failures, if you will. Bill has been, I love Tony Romo on the broadcast on Sunday said, look at Bill, he's ecstatic. <laughs> and of course, Bill was just being Bill. Love just the prime Bill form. I loved when he said after the game about Tom Brady's, the cut on his hand. We're not talking about open heart surgery nope. here. So classic Bill heading into another Super Bowl. Bill was in a good mood. Yeah, Patriots are heading to the Super Bowl. I mean, that's the big news of the week, uh, obviously. And Bill Belichick was in a good mood yesterday about it. Uh, ESPN reporter Mike Reese did remind him the Patriots have not scored in the first quarter of a Super Bowl, and Bill kind of had a funny retort for that. Uh, some people might look at that as Bill being a curmudgeon, but there was some humor involved in that exchange. So, yeah, all, all good things from Bill yesterday. Yeah, I think that was probably his his most curmudgeonly, uh, most curm as curmudgeonly as he got during that, yeah. that news conference. You could tell he, he was joking at first, but he was like, hey, come on. Don't remind me of. You can tell that that still sticks in his mind. Yeah. It's like, I've won five Super Bowls here, but I still hate that I haven't scored in the first quarter. Yeah, it's tough. Well, when we look at what did go down on Sunday, guys, I want to talk to you about some of the stuff we were talking about after the game. It was a very strange feeling to watch the Patriots come back in epic fashion against the Jags, who everyone thought that they should beat anyway, but the way the game played out at times really didn't look like they could win the game, but I personally never once it, during that game thought that the Patriots aren't winning that game. I knew that they would come back. We've seen it before and even though part of me is like, I mean, how many times can you go down like that, especially in big games and come back? But when we were talking about just walking through the tunnels and being out on the field with the confetti, it almost felt like something was missing. It's like, and I know that where media members were supposed to be neutral and not caught up in the excitement, but I mean, we are human. Everyone feels the energy within the stadium. And it just felt like another day in Foxborough. We've been here, we've done this so many times. It, it did feel a little bit like old head. And I wouldn't say that there was no moment during the game where I didn't, I, I didn't think that the Patriots were just, I don't know. I don't know how to word this. I, I, I thought the Patriots could lose, but I didn't think that they couldn't win at any point during that game. I think that that's the way I would put it. And really when they hit rock bottom was when Deion Lewis lost the fumble uh, when they were down by 10. I was thinking at that point, this is going to be really tough for them to mount a comeback at this point. But in the back of your mind, you're always thinking, well, they did come back from 28-3. to three, So anything really is possible after the Patriots can do that in the Super Bowl. Yeah, that's really going to be in my mind, and I think in the minds of, of most Patriots fans, probably forever, for at least as long as um, as long as Tom Brady and Bill Belichick are here. No matter the deficit, I mean, they were trailing, what was it? They were down by 10 with 8-ish minutes ago. It was yeah. like midway through the fourth quarter. And normally that is, that is something that most NFL teams can't come back from, especially in the playoffs. I think I read a stat there was only, it's only the fourth or fifth time that a team has erased a, a double-digit deficit in the fourth quarter of a playoff game. But when you look to last year and, and they were looking at a deficit two and a half times that, it's this team has has kind of the mental fortitude to, uh, to come back from anything. And I think even, even before the, the comeback officially started, you could see some sort of a shift early in the second half where although the, the, the Patriots weren't really catching up to the Jaguars yet, what the Jaguars were doing in the first half that had worked for them wasn't working in the second half. So it almost at some point it seemed like it was a matter of time before the Patriots, if they didn't end up winning, at least they would come to bring it within a field goal and kind of make it a, a one-score game. Watching the game, what I know, I was watching with Jemai Webster, one of our guys on Nesson, and he was the one that said after Bortles made a good play, he was like, man, these guys are just out here playing. 
And I know that's a simple thing to say, but I got what he meant. The Jaguars came out, I felt like very relaxed and they were just playing. And we've seen so many teams get it, where they almost just beat themselves, whether it's here at Gillette Stadium or against the Patriots. It's like you could see that they all of a sudden, instead of just playing, I felt like the Jags got more into don't mess up mode. And that's where it, I... Well, Jalen Ramsey actually even said that to teammates during the game. There's a mic'd up segment uh, that aired on, it was an NFL film segment. There was a, a turning point and then there was also a sound effects. On sound effects, Jalen Ramsey is spotted saying to teammates, we have to stay aggressive because we keep letting teams back into games because we start to hold back a little bit. We have to stay aggressive in this game. It was kind of prophetic thinking there from Jalen Ramsey because that's exactly what they did. Again, they did not stay aggressive. They held back and were trying to, you know, hold on for dear life to this win when all they really had to do was stay aggressive in that game and keep doing what they had done in the first half. And they probably would have won. But anytime a team lets up even a little bit against the Patriots, then that just allows them to open up the door yeah, for, for a comeback win. It might not even have really looked, at, looked like that while they were playing. But if you go back and actually look at the play calling, that the Jaguars had in the second half. We were all praising um, uh, Nathaniel Hackett, the, the Jaguars' offensive coordinator in the first half, for the creative game plan he came out with. We'd throw into uh, to Corey Grant, who really hadn't touched the ball much all season, especially in the passing game, and uh, kind of just coming with, with real creative looks. Then in the second half, it just it was the complete opposite. They did the exact same thing on every single drive. It was just first down, handoff to Leonard Fournette, second down, try to throw deep. And both of those didn't work. Then they're in third and long, and then the Patriots defense did a good job of kind of getting out the field in most of those situations. So you, you need to play, we've said it before, you need to play a perfect game to beat the Patriots. And the Jaguars played like an 87% perfect game. And that's not enough, as they found out. Yeah, then speaking of the defense, oh, check. I, was, I thought you were going to say speaking of 87 because Rob Gronkowski. I was going to, that is, we can do that. We're going to get to that. Time. We're going to get to that next. Oh, but I, I don't want to skip <laughs> over this because then <laughs> we're going into a whole new segment of the show and just one thing at a time here. Um, however, I, I, I like that way to be on your toes. Um, but check this out, this Instagram from James Harrison. Doing work the next day and um, Tom Brady commenting on it, beast. Um, so just, I mean, what does this say to you guys about the defense's just mentality and their work ethic they're out there grinding they certainly have improved since the beginning of the season and how did, much did that show in that game on Sunday I thought it showed especially in the second half they really stepped up but I mean that's kind of what they've been doing ever since week four is that they'll allow some points in the first half and then in the second half they really shut it down and that's a lot of what we saw last year too and it's I think what we've kind of seen throughout this entire Bill Belichick dynasty is that the Patriots defense knows when they have to lock down it usually comes in the second half that allows the offense to step up and, and get the lead and then the defense continues to lock it down in the second half and that's how the Patriots win and one of the biggest plays of the game was Stephon Gilmore on fourth and what was it 15 uh, at the end of the fourth quarter he made an incredible pass breakup on a pass from Blake Bortles to uh, to D.D. Westbrook and those are the plays that the Patriots defense needs and that's the place that the Patriots defense continues to get and like I said goes back to last year too with Dante Hightower's sack in the Super Bowl and they just always come up with those huge plays when it absolutely matters and maybe if there's 10 minutes left in the fourth quarter they aren't making those plays but when there's two minutes left they are making yeah those talking plays. to some players after the game some defensive players who were like what what kind of halftime adjustments did you make because obviously the, the defense came out so much better in the second half they said including uh, Harrison himself they're like there really weren't any halftime mm -hmm. adjustments we just weren't playing well in the first half we weren't executing Eric Rowe said he came out and said we were playing soft in the first half we knew we had to be more aggressive and once we were more aggressive then things started happening, and that's exactly what happened. They didn't really play. They didn't switch up their scheme. They didn't switch up their kind of blitz packages or anything like that. They just executed better. They played more aggressive, and eventually it kind of pushed them past the Jaguars. Uh, Devin McCourty said, was asked after the game, what's the key to these incredible Patriots comebacks coming back from such a large deficit? And he said, well, first of all, it starts with not playing well coming out of the gates, which yeah. is such a good point yeah. and speaks to what – they're able to do it's like I mean they wouldn't be in that position if they came out as hot in the first half as True. they do in yeah, the second they half. They really didn't change their approach much they the entire game they were basically daring the Jaguars to throw because they were not going to let Leonard Fournette beat them on the ground and they did not let Leonard Fournette beat them on the ground and when the Jaguars did get off to a lead and they wanted to drain the clock the Patriots were still stout against the run and not letting Leonard Fournette get any big gains and they weren't letting him get first downs there in the second half so they were actually really smart to not change that approach they knew it was a winning approach coming into the game probably took longer than they thought it would to actually 
get the lead and get the win, but in the end, it absolutely did work. So I think a moment when a lot of Patriots fans thought that this really could be the nail in the coffin is when we saw number 87 Rob Gronkowski go out and leave the field after that big hit with the head injury and then when he was announced officially out for the game and now so let's get into our injury update he has been diagnosed with a concussion he's on the injury report with a concussion wasn't out there today also Dietrich Wise and Malcolm Brown not out there today Zach I know you were out at practice just what sense are you getting and can you get any sense of Gronkowski's status at this point if the Patriots had to play on Sunday then it would be a very big concern that Rob Gronkowski was not at practice on Thursday. The fact that they get a week off between these games really boosts his chances of playing exponentially, I would say. I mean, you can never really tell with concussions. It's it's such a tricky injury where you see guys suffer concussions and then play six days later. You see guys suffer concussions and then be out for a month or two. So you really can't tell. And it seemed to be, I mean, obviously it's, it's hard to judge the severity of a concussion by looking at it, but Rob Gronkowski was pretty much out on his feet after he got hit by Barry Church there. He could hardly stand. You, you saw him talking after, after uh, you can kind of read his lips when he's talking to Chris Hogan on the field saying, I don't, I don't know what just happened. So he was, he got hit pretty hard. So who knows whether that's, whether, I mean, how, how the recovery time is from that. It's different for every person, obviously. But I don't think we're going to get a good sense of whether Rob Gronkowski will play in this game until about 90 minutes from kickoff. Was, I mean, I'm sure we'll hear some reports next week that, to kind of indicate, but I'm not expecting to hear anything from Bill Belichick, any confirmation from the team. It's, it's going to be a big talking point all week. The we will know if he can return to practice, though, because there yes. will be practice sports next week. So if he is back at practice, that's definitely going to be a good sign uh, for his playing status. And I think as far as this week goes, the smart move right now is to rest him for as long yeah. as possible. No need. Get him back on the field next week if he can get back on the field because you don't want to force him back on the field have him, you know, suffer something else or, or get, you know, a setback or something. So hold him out as long as you can, get him to Minnesota, then have him start practicing again. Plus, you know that this is going to be something, obviously, that the NFL is going to be really careful about because it is a head injury. And, Zach, you brought up the conversation he had with Chris Hogan immediately after the injury. We were watching from the press box, and when I looked up at the replay, they ISOed Hogan and Gronk just as it was like, Hogan was kind of pulling Gronk up and there was something about it was more Hogan's eyes yeah. that you could see very clearly and you could almost see it on Hogan's face yeah. that he could tell that something was very but, wrong with Gronk that's why I was not surprised when yeah. they ruled Gronk Abs officially absolutely. out of that game no yeah you could tell pretty much right away that we probably wouldn't be seeing yeah. any more of Rob Gronkowski in that game but we should note that it is kind of tough to, to judge the severity yeah. of concussions and it's a little right. irresponsible almost to look and be like oh this guy looks like he got hit in the head more because Dietrich Wise got hit in the head during the first half late in the first half he played the entire rest of the game he was dancing around in the uh, postgame celebration and now he's missed a practice with a concussion so you never really know and it's, it's really going to be kind of something that we'll just have to monitor until next week. And uh, just on Gronk's concussion, I can tell, I think, when Hogan had to hold him up. Yep. As soon as he had to hold him over, up, yeah. that we everyone knew that Gronk was going to be out for the rest of the game because if someone can't be on their feet on their own, then they can't finish the game. I will say about the concussion, though, it wasn't a situation where he was knocked unconscious. It wasn't a situation where there was any fencing in his arms. He didn't have to be helped off the field, you know, other than Chris Hogan kind of keeping him up. So I think that that's maybe a positive sign. But like you're saying, it is tough to judge how long a player can be out with a concussion based on their symptoms immediately afterwards. So we will just have to see. But it's not total doomsday, I would say, based on, you know, the hit that he saw. Yeah, so we'll be keeping tabs on that. But as for the Patriots' opponents, the Philadelphia Eagles, let's get into the team that they will be facing in Super Bowl 52. They have, of course, played the in one against the Eagles in Super Bowl's past 39. Why 39. am I not? Super Bowl 39. 13 years ago. Victory, yep. yes. Um, very long time ago. And uh, let's start with the underdog factor because the Eagles have been underdogs throughout this playoff run and they're out there wearing those masks which creep the living hell out of me. I really don't like those masks. I love dogs. I don't like animal heads. There were also, speaking of weird animal head masks, there were some weird, um, do you guys see the albino goats that they showed on the Jumbotron uh, yeah. here at Gillette? Yeah. I don't know why they were like albino looking. Their eyes were I red. Were it looks like a, think, yeah, but yeah. it really creeped me out. I don't know, something about an animal head on a person's body really freaks me out. <laughs> and then the added factor of the fact that these guys have shoulder pads on, so their shoulders look extra big, and then the head looks kind of <laughs> too small. 
it's creepy. It's an Chris, intimidating look when you Chris see it on Long, Chris Long with yeah. the tattoos. Yes, it's yeah. very, very, like, that's what nightmares and horror movies are made of. But they have been riding that underdog wave, and I do feel like it's been fueling this team. Um, but then you look at, I mean, the Jaguars were kind of the same way. They had that underdog mentality, and they were not able to beat the Patriots. This is one of those things that I might just be a skeptic. Maybe I'm a non-believer. I just, I don't think it matters. The better team's going to win. I, I think if you have to be motivated by being an underdog, then I don't know, maybe it works. But I think the Eagles beat those teams because they were better. I don't think that the Eagles blew out the Vikings because they were underdogs in the game and because no one believed in them. The Vikings just didn't play as well, and that's why the Eagles won. So I don't think that this is spelling doomsday for the Patriots because the Eagles are underdogs again. I think the Patriots play better than the Eagles. The Patriots will win this game. There's been a lot of teams that have been underdogs throughout the years that have lost games. That's why they're underdogs. And I think that, you know, my initial projection is that the same thing's going to happen on Super yeah, Sunday. Yeah, I will say it's probably an overplayed storyline. But I do like when the, there's not many things in sports that I hate more than favorites pretending that they're underdogs right. like yeah. teams going yeah. into playing like the nobody believes us card even even the uh like going back i love kg but going back to the, the kevin garnett anything is possible i'd be like dude you guys won like 65 games you're the best team in the league come yeah. on this, this is ob obviously possible but they're one of the rare number one seeds who can say that yeah. they ever that nobody believed in them because they were underdogs at home in both of their playoff games they kind of squeaked by the falcons and then just kick the crap out of the Vikings, who I thought the Patriots were going to be seeing in the Super Bowl. I thought they were going to beat the uh, the Eagles last week. So they they're, they have a legitimate gripe in that they had a great regular season. Yeah, they lost Carson Wentz, but they're playing incredibly well right now. Nick Foles actually looks like a pretty competent NFL quarterback, so they, they have a reason to, to be fired up about it, I well, think. I think that it was Zach Ertz that said we have an all-pro squad on IR and the Eagles I mean just like every other team have been victim to terrible injuries I think if Carson Wentz was playing in this Super Bowl then I mean it would be a really exciting because then you've got this up-and-coming quarterback Wentz versus Brady we've got Foles versus Brady though I think I mean I really wanted to see Breeze versus Brady in the Super Bowl I think that just it would have been a, a sexy headliner but that's not the case um, but although Foles has been playing well Zach I want to ask you what part of the Eagles offense scares you at all or do you think the Patriots need to be most wary of as they prepare to take these guys on on one hand you can either view this as something that it should scare them or something that it should not scare them. Todd, or Doug Peterson, rather, runs an offense very similar to the ones, the one that the Patriots saw from the Kansas City Chiefs in Week One. Because he's a he's an Andy Reid disciple. He was he was with the Chiefs forever. So they run a very similar offense with a lot of uh, read pass options, a lot of kind of misdirection. Basically, all it's all kind of based on getting the defense uncomfortable and out of the position that they want to play in. You could say that that offense did have a ton of success against the Patriots in week one. You can also say that the Patriots have already seen that offense now, so they already kind of know its tricks, know its kind of um, nuances and whatnot. And I guess Nick Foles and, and Alex Smith are kind of similar quarterbacks. Maybe you'd probably say Alex Smith is probably a little bit better because he's been able to hold down the starting job, but neither of them are kind of superstars, even to the level of, of Carson Wentz. So, I don't know. I think it's going to be a good game. I'm not expecting a, a blowout on either end. I think having two weeks to prepare for this offense and having already seen one that's kind of similar to it, I think will definitely help the Patriots defense here. I, what are you thinking? I think that, you know, I, there's certainly similarities between the Eagles and the yeah. Chiefs, and it's actually interesting because 13 years later, the Patriots defense is basically playing the same Eagles offense that they saw in Super Bowl 39. It, it is still that, that Andy Reid West Coast offense, but I just think the, the Chiefs have better high-end offensive weapons. They've got Tyree Kill. They've got Travis Kelsey. They've got, you know, even Kareem Hunt probably individually is better than any individual Eagles running back. And the same can be said about Tyree Kill and Kelsey. The Eagles probably have more offensive depth. But if you're comparing the offenses, I think you'd have to say that Alex Smith is better. I think you have to say Kareem Hunt's better. You'd have to say Tyree Kill is better. And you'd have to say that Kelsey's better. So I think that that's certainly where the Patriots have an advantage over what they what happened in week one at the same time Eagles defense is quite a bit better than the Chiefs defense so it will be a good so matchup. I want to get into yeah. Doug I'll ask you what you think the Eagles defense will be able to do as far as slowing down Tom Brady who has been able to work with anything he's got out on the field and be able to pull off incredible wins this season. I mean I think they'll be able to slow him down kind of in the same way that the Jaguars defense was able to slow him down but 
you can't really fully stop Tom Brady. It's just not possible. And I think that the Jaguars' defense that they faced was probably the best defense in the NFL. So they are kind of taking a small step down here facing against the Eagles. I think the Eagles are very talented. I think Malcolm Jenkins is good. I think Chris Long. I think they have a lot of, of good you know, pieces in that defense, but they aren't nearly as talented top to bottom as the Jaguars defense that they just faced, the Jaguars defense that they just put 24 points up against. Yeah, I think so. the, the Eagles defensive front is definitely probably the strength of the entire team. Mm -hmm. They basically have, as as uh, Bill Belichick said yesterday, we were asking about their, their front four. He said, I wish it was just four. It's mm -hmm. more like eight or nine. It might not be eight or nine, but it's at least six or seven mm -hmm. quality pass rushers that they can just kind of cycle in there, including Chris Long, who's had an awesome season in his mm -hmm. first year in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. I think that's it's a comparable unit to to the Jaguars. I think the Jaguars at their have probably a higher ceiling yeah. on the front with some of their pass rushers there, but they're not nearly as deep. Right. So if, if I'm picking one, I might even pick the the Eagles over them. But I also think that the Eagles secondary is is not nearly as good right. as the um, as the the Jaguars, especially at cornerback. So yeah. it's there's similar defenses, but I do think that they're going to be playing. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely think the Jaguars is, is maybe a little bit of a higher class. Yeah. So Chris faster Long, linebackers yeah, there, faster, yeah, yeah, the linebackers were a big problem. Yeah. On Chris Sunday. Long's a guy we've already shown him with the the dog thing on, and between him and Legarrette Blunt two familiar faces from last year's Super Bowl winning team. Check this out, LeGarrette Blunt's Instagram, but notice the caption. He's using the hashtag one more, which dun 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 was the Patriots there. You know, they have the whole not done thing going on this season. One more was their slogan hashtag thingy last season when LeGarrette Blunt was with the team and won a Super Bowl. Maybe he was saying that it was only one more than a not two more, so the Eagles are going to win this year. What? If, it, if last year all they wanted was one more, they didn't want two more. Yeah, yeah. that was just going over that your was head. A, that was well, a dumb I always thing. wondered I why the ha what you're saying it doesn't isn't making sense to me. The hashtag never made sense <laughs> to me <laughs> because <laughs> why would you say one more if here we are again? Well, that would have made me think that, that they retired. Like Derek Jeter's last season. If right. like Tom Brady was retired. Yeah. Then but you, why then would LeGarrette Blunt be saying one more? I think it's a coincidence. If. Honestly, I think it's a coincidence. Yeah. But I was I was joking. If they only wanted one more, <laughs> and they already then they got the one. Two more at the time. Right. But you didn't say. Eagles get the two because the Patriots already got the one. Anyway. Whatever. Um, I just think that that was weird. Maybe they was only wanted maybe one more in 2016. <laughs> they didn't want two more. Yeah, I get. I got that. So, I don't know what you're <laughs> I don't even think you know what you're saying at this point. I, I, I do. I know what you're saying. We What's both know saying? what I'm saying. What's he saying? <laughs> All right. <laughs> the Patriots won one. They yeah. won their one more last yes. year. So now there's no reason for them to get two. So, so you're yeah, saying the Eagles, the Eagles are going to get one, one more. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I get that, but that's so not you get it. Okay. <laughs> uh, moving, this is moving along. Yes, moving anyway, along. moving right along. Um, do you think that they at all will be able to provide any intel on the way the Patriots operate? I know we talked about this when they were playing, when the Patriots were playing Tennessee and whether Logan Ryan would be able to help them out. I mean, it's never really seemed to to no, do much I, don't think so. I mean ever Chris Long was here for one year yeah well, Garrett Blunt I, I yeah I don't think so all right yeah. so no more no more no <laughs> more talk about them we're ago. on to Minnesota know. but then what is this and this is a little bit of looking ahead I know we will have a lot to talk about in the coming weeks but let's start with Matt Patricia he was out on the field we all saw him hours after the game rolling around in the confetti just really seeming to soak it all in I got a video of him and Bon Jovi just being very ecstatic after the big win um, and then the fact that he's out there hours later laying on his back his kids on his stomach his wife's out there they're having a ball I mean I, who doesn't love taking confetti pics I know I do but to see him out there for so much longer after, I mean, no one else really was out there that much longer. Yeah. I yeah. think he was relishing the moment. It yeah. definitely seemed like a, uh, this is my last game in this stadium kind of deal. I mean, we, we talked, we asked him about it on the conference call the next day. He was, just, he was like, no, my, my son wanted to play on the field. And it was like, nice to have a fun moment with him, which I'm sure is true. But I'm sure part of it was also the fact that, that he's had, he spent 13 years here. I mean, he came here in 2004, and if this is, if that was his last game as a Patriots coach at Gillette, which we all expect it to be, because we expect him to leave for for the Detroit Lions. I I, don't, I, I understand it. Yeah, I mean, it makes you, sense. This has been your your real home for 
for almost a decade and a half. You might, might as well uh, soak it all in while you can. He also gave Bill Belichick a huge hug after the game. <laughs> so after that 2004 game, it was what? Bill Belichick, okay. Romeo Cornell, and Charlie Weiss all hugged each other after that game because Charlie Weiss and Romeo Cornell were leaving. I would expect if the Patriots win this year, well, the same thing might happen with McDaniels and Patricia. So Bowl. McDaniels, the Indianapolis Colts requested another meeting with him, which I know nothing can become official until after the Super Bowl, but I mean, does that indicate to you guys that he's as good as gone as well? I think that that's kind of been the report out there. This one's a little bit shakier, maybe from like one or two reporters, but I think everyone does expect McDaniels to leave for the Colts. He's reportedly already putting together a staff, so I would say that both of them are pretty much as good as gone. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say that the one thing that we do know is that uh, Patriots linebackers coach Brian Flores is not getting a head coaching job, so at least the Patriots will still have a defensive coordinator and waiting um, on the staff next year. Yeah, that is definitely a big boost for the team. And I was just going to say that this this is being reported as a, as a second interview for, for Josh McDaniels, but from the reports I saw, I can't remember who exactly reported it, was that they're basically just going to use it as, as an early meeting because through, for the, through the rest of Super Bowl week, Josh McDaniels and any other assistant coaches aren't allowed to have contact with, with potential employers um, with, with other teams. So I think they're just going to, from what it sounds like, it's basically a done deal, and they're just going to kind of sit down with, with Chris Ballard and Jim Irsay and kind of work out some of the kinks while they can. It would be interesting if they actually started hiring some of McDaniels' uh, assistant coaches because one of them is Matt Eberfloss. I think that's how he's Cowboys. Something yeah. like that. He was, a lineba he was a linebacker's coach and defensive passing coordinator of the Cowboys. So if you start to see the Colts hiring him and hiring some other guys who have been close to McDaniels, then you know for sure that McDaniels is coming in as the head coach. All right. Well, we'll have t plenty of time to speculate as to who their replacements will be and what that will mean for this dynasty here in New England after the Super Bowl. But for now, let's go to our worst take <laughs> of the week. And this take was coming from Every Everywhere. direction, mostly, mostly a lot of wars, yeah. Uh, yeah, fans that are, are not fans of New England, um, but saying that the refs won the game for the Patriots. I mean, I disagree with that. I look at, I thought that the Jaguars played a really good game for the first three-ish quarters. Honestly, I think they did. I think that they beat themselves. Mm -hmm. The penalties that they racked up, I. I I just don't think you can blame the refs because when you played the replays, it, it, they clearly were making those penalties, so they deserve to be called. I understand the frustration. If I were a Jaguars fan, I would have been frustrated, not at the refs, at the fact that these guys are making dumb p penalties that really affected the game. I think there's there's two cases to be made. I do think that this is the worst take of the week because Patriots obviously aren't paying off officials. There's no like grand conspiracy. The Patriots aren't winning games because of the officials. They're winning games because they're more disciplined. The, the two cases that can be made on this is that Miles Jack, the whistle blew early when he stripped the ball from Deion Lewis. He probably should have had a touchdown on that play. I don't think that Deion Lewis touched him after Miles Jack came up with possession of the ball. I don't know what they would have ruled if that was replayed, but they blew the whistle early and he wasn't able to return it. The other thing is that it is a little bit strange that the Patriots didn't have a single offensive or defensive penalty in the game. That's just very rare to see. At the same time, you're not seeing Jaguars fans tweet out clips of like, this was obviously holding or this was obviously pass interference. I think the Patriots did play a nearly perfect game as far as penalties go on offense and defense. And that's just because they're better coached than other teams. They have better technique than other teams. They're way more disciplined than other teams. And that's why they don't get penalties. Maybe other teams should just coach their teams better. Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say. I mean, the argument that if a team gets more penalties than the other team, that means that the refs were, were out to get them. That doesn't make sense. I mean, teams who get more penalties typically are less disciplined, whether they're less less disciplined as like a franchise in, in, in general or just in that particular game. The Patriots are known for being one of the most disciplined, most most drilled teams in the NFL. And going back to what you said, there's or what you said, Michaela, there's no instance, I haven't seen anything floating around on Twitter of, of someone pointing at a, a picture at, at Nate Solder and being like, see, why did they not call this? And <laughs> Well, I think what, there actually could have been a couple penalties only... that weren't called against the, the Jaguars that could have. There were a couple other potential iffy pass interferences. So you can look at that and be maybe, maybe the Miles Jack call was a questionable call. That's a tough play. It's a it's a bang bang play. You can also argue that maybe Deion Lewis pinned it to his hip and yeah, it wasn't that's a fumble. The first thing, yeah. So it's what something you, that kind of goes. What do back you and make forth. of the footage of the ref after 
one of the, I don't remember exactly what touchdown, but where it appeared that the ref was smiling and congratulating Tom Brady. That's I know a lot of people yeah. were yeah. upset about people that, forget. saying that the ref should have conducted himself more professionally and no. more objectively. Well, the one where the ref is smiling is, is as he's trying to like break up the, the fracas it's fake that broke news. out. So, yeah, but what Jaguars fans don't point out is that literally two seconds before that happened, Miles Jack pile drove James White into the ground in the end zone five yards deep two seconds after he scored. That should probably should have been an unnecessary roughness penalty. If the Patriots, if, if there had been a call the other way, Patriots fans would have been saying, what the hell, this guy just grabbed our running back by the head and, and drove, drove him into the ground. Yeah, so, the ref was not celebrating. He was like, I think if anything, he was laughing at Cameron Fleming because Cameron Fleming was like, why didn't you call this penalty on Miles Jack? Because he drove him into the ground, yeah. smacked him on the helmet and like climbed over him. I think Cameron Fleming was probably just having like an overreaction to it. And the ref, who we've like, actually like talked to before when he's been down here um, at the stadium in, in preseason, he's just a guy with a good sense of humor. So I think he was just kind of laughing about it. And he was kind of pushing Patriots away from him to basically be like, stop yelling at me over this. It's fine. You guys scored a touchdown. Yeah. It, it was, he was not celebrating. He just had a smile on his face because, I don't know, isn't he the same guy who put the, pulled the card out in the Correct. Cowboys game? It, it might have been. And, yeah. like, he basically did that as, like, a goof. So I think he's just a, a guy with a good and sense if you, of humor. If you listen yeah. to any of these, like, sound effects, uh, behind-the-scenes kind of segments, there's an ongoing dialogue between the, the players and the referees at all times. It's not yeah. like they operate in completely different silos. So they do have interaction between each other. And who knows, maybe someone was, was talking smack two plays right. earlier and, and, and there was just an, an inside joke there or something yeah. like that. It's, yeah, you can't look at that and say conspiracy. Plus, it all goes back to why do people think that the NFL wants to help the Patriots win right. when they basically did everything in their power two years ago to make sure the Patriots didn't point. win. Yeah. There's no reason for them to completely reverse course and say, okay, this is the team that we want to, to win every game, so we're going to rig every game in, in their favor. It literally does not make any sense. Yeah, that's very true. So definitely a very bad take and the worst take of the week. Yeah. So you guys will be heading out to Minnesota, so that's going to be exciting. Well, you guys will have all lots of, America of coverage, for a whole coverage week. from yeah. there these two and our fine colleague Courtney Cox so make sure to follow all of them um, on their journeys we will be definitely in touch with you back and Matt forth Chatham too. we'll be holding it yeah. holding down the fort back here in New England um, and on that note any other final thoughts you guys um, probably gonna be eating a lot of mall Chinese food next week it's my final thought. Can't All wait. Right. Yeah. Also, we should say thanks to uh, the Hall of Patriot Place. Yes. yes. This is probably Huge the last thanks. episode that we'll shoot yeah. here until, yeah. uh, until training camp or yeah. probably next winter. We've actually, had a great nice time enough. here. Lots of people looking at all the hardware oh, yeah. that's all around they, us. They've made it so awesome. we didn't have yes. to sit outside Thank you in 20 so degree much weather for, your for an hour every week. So. Everyone here has been amazing. Very much yeah, appreciated. Yeah, we probably would have died if we had to do this I would have gotten, gotten frostbite on some of my Yeah, we'd be We'd be losing limbs. Yeah. So thank you very much. And we have an exciting couple of weeks ahead of us so make sure to keep it with us here on Nesson.com.